The Australian government has changed, and George talked about how how much influence uh, the uh, the issue of anthropogenic global warming has had on uh, on on the leaders of the political parties and uh, and and who's in power. While the government's changed, the anthropogenic global warming paradigm which dominates has not changed. And from a science perspective, it still defines the research questions asked and the public policy solutions to some extent that are at least put forward to government. And the scientists involved are still up to their old tricks. Remember the climate gate emails that Phil Jones um, and Phil Jones' trick of beginning with a proxy temperature record and then substituting this with instrumental records when the proxy temperature record started to show decline. What I'm planning to show you this afternoon is how climate scientists at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology outsource the development of warming trends, not to Phil Jones, but to computer algorithms. And until this trick is more widely understood, it's actually going to be difficult for any Australian government, uh, while the carbon tax may be repealed, it's going to be difficult for them to move beyond anthropogenic global warming as a theory that dominates discussions about climate science. Because, as Richard Linson so brilliantly explained in his essay for the Journal of American Physi Physicians and Surgeons last year, politicians are obliged to respond to alarm from scientists. So I'm going to talk about one aspect of anthropogenic global warming that Australian politicians like George have to deal with, the temperature record, by way of acknowledgments, I need to say that analysis of the temperature data for Amberley, uh, which is the data set that I'm going to talk about this afternoon, was informed by discussions with Gavin Schmidt from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, but also from collaborations with Ken Stewart, a blogger who lives in Rockhampton in Queensland. At the very beginning of this year, David Jones, the Manager of Climate Monitoring and Predictions at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, put out a media release explaining that last year, 2013, was the hottest year on record. And he followed up with radio interviews in which he said, and I quote, we know every place across Australia is getting hotter and very similarly, almost every place on this planet. So you know, we know it's getting hotter, and we know it will continue to get hotter. It's a reality and something we will be living with for the rest of this century. Clearly, Dr. Jones, who advises the government, doesn't take much notice of the satellite data that suggests there's been a 17-year-long pause in global warming, Indeed, he's more interested in the instrumental temperature record, but not so much with the observational data, more the homogenized data developed with algori algorithms. Now, according to various peer-reviewed papers, homogenization is a technique that enables non-climatic factors to be eliminated from temperature records. And it can be important, and it can be usefully applied. For example, in Australia, many records from stations uh, where temperatures were recorded at post office were then moved to airports. And it may be necessary to apply some level of homogenization to the data if you want a continuous record for that general area. But at a place called Amberley in Queensland, the temperature record has been recorded continuously since 1941 at a well-maintained site, and there's no need for any homogenization. I'm using Amberley as a case study to, Im, uh, to illustrate the homogenization trick that, contain, that can change temperatures, 
so that last year is always cooler than next year. Now, Amberley is Australia's largest Air Force base, located near the city of Brisbane and about halfway down Australia's east coast. The unhomogenised mean annual maximum temperature for Amberley, and it's up on the screen there, since recordings were first made in 1941, shows temperatures trending up from a low of about 25.5 degrees Celsius in 1950 to a peak of almost 28.5 at 28.5 in 2002. That's the maximum temperature. But the minimum temperature for Amberley shows cooling from about 1970. Of course, this cooling does not accord with anthropogenic global warming theory. So the Bureau of Meteorology has changed the minimum temperature data by jumping up the minimum temperatures twice through an homogenization process, once around 1980 and then around 1996, to achieve a combined temperature increase of over 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is a very large step change, remembering that the entire temperature increase associated with global warming over the 20th century is considered to be in the order of 0.8 degrees Celsius. Through the homogenization process, the Bureau has changed what was a cooling trend in the minimum temperature of around one degree per century into a warming trend of 2.5 degrees Celsius per century. This is the effect of those two step ups. Now NASA's uh, no small change, but a change in the trend from cooling to warming. NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies also supplies a jump up to the Amberley series because it's incorporated into their series, which then informs the IPCC. And they've made other changes. So the annual average temperature for Amberley increases for the series that's then incorporated into the IPCC temperature record by about two degrees. Its new director, Gavin Schmidt, has been blunt about what has been done to the Amberley minimum temperature record in a discussion with me on Twitter. He explained to me, and I quote, there is an inhomogeneity detected around 1980, and based on continuity with nearby stations, it, is, it has been corrected, not rocket science. When I sought clarification regarding what was meant by nearby stations, Gavin Schmidt provided me with a list of 310 localities used by climate scientists at Berkeley who have also homogenized the Amberley data and found a discontinuity in 1980. But these 310 nearby stations in inverted commas, they stretch to a radius of 605 miles and include Hamilton Island across the Coral Sea, and they go in the opposite direction over the Great Dividing Range and use the temperature record for Quilpie in Australia's outback. Now, considering the unhomogenized data for six truly nearby stations that are part of what is recognised as a high quality network, the Bureau's jump up for Amberley creates an increase for the official trend of 0 0.7 degrees Celsius per century. And if you look at the closest nearby high quality station, Brisbane Aero, this is a station that's part of what's called the Acorn Sat network, it actually follows the Amberley trend. Indeed, perhaps the cooling at Amberley is real. Why not consider this in the absence of physical evidence to the contrary? In the Twitter conversation with Dr. Schmidt, I suggest that it was nonsense to use temperature data from radically different climatic zones to change the observational data for Amberley. Dr. Schmidt replied, and I quote, your question is ill-posed. No one changed the trend directly. Instead, procedures corrected for a detected jump around 
1980. Procedures corrected. Dr. Schmidt's referring, of course, to the mathematical algorithms that reach out to nearby locations that are across the Coral Sea and beyond the Great Dividing Range to change what was a mild cooling trend into dramatic warming for an otherwise perfectly politically incorrect temperature series. I don't have time in my presentation today to explain in detail the theoretical basis or mathematics that underpins the algorithms, but perhaps we can discuss this in question time. There are various excellent technical papers, including a paper in Agriculture and Forestry Meteorology, Volume 49, and it shows how if you let these algorithms correct for discontinuities independently of any oversight, every time, for example, a hedgerow is cut down, there is potential for a discontinuity. And when you apply these algorithms to correct for this continuity, a warming trend can be either generated or exaggerated. In a book I highly recommend, Science and Public Policy, The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Science, Professor Ainsley Kello from the University of Tasmania explains how reliance on computer models as well as the infusion of values has produced a preference for virtual over observational data. Now governments around the world, including the new Abbott government and including George Christensen, who is here today, he is confronted with data from the people who are employed to advise the government, data that uh, that, it, that they use the instrumental record and it's homogenized such that it can give the impression of catastrophic global warming. Until something is done about this issue of data homogenization, we are stuck with a paradigm full of clever tricks. Thank you.